Nyani is a biological phenomenon, simply defined as the retention or prolongation of traits in adults that are normally associated with children. Nyani is extremely prevalent in the human female. Over time and uncounted generations, evolution selected for neotenous features in the human female because, for whatever reason, human males express their preference for neotenous females in offering their labor, provision, and resources to this group, as opposed to females with fewer neotenous features, and mating with them, thus providing increased chances of greater neoteny in female offspring, and raising highly neotenous features to be a standard that is now effectively the standard across the globe, irrespective of culture or country when it comes to the preferences of men in choosing mates. Since neoteny on its own is a purely biological phenomenon, it will likely have given birth to social phenomena related to it, inasmuch as a biological phenomenon is the precursor to a social and cultural phenomenon by dint of simple precedence. We are also aware of hypoagency, a term I coined a while back to describe women's seeming unwillingness or inability to affect changes upon the world directly, often working through proxy agents, i.e. men. Hypoagency is also clearly a derivative of selective pressures in the past when the environment our ancestors lived in was radically different to the current one, and the average male's superior strength, as an example, put him in what was essentially a caretaker role to the female. And because we had lived in such a harsh environment that likely required such a setup for far longer than the current one of comfort extraordinaire, this phenomenon of hypoagency has become ingrained in the human psyche, both in, fe in the female, uh, in her perception of herself, and male perception of women. Men had, for millennia, been exposed to constant stress, duress, and violent death. And women had been, to the extent that it was possible, spared of most of that. And unsurprisingly, this pattern continues today, since we are all still running on 20,000-year-old software. You often see comments along the lines of women essentially being adult children. And given the verifiable facts of physiological neoteny, as well as the psychologically and behaviorally observable hypoagency, there seems to be something to this. If women have evolved to have juvenile features, and men prefer this, and women are protected to a greater extent from the ravages of life by those self-same men, having been taken care of for the most part in the past, it stands to reason that Mentally, a great portion of women have remained, psychologically speaking, in certain respects in, a, in an arrested state of development in their behavior, a behavior which can readily be likened to that of a child. And quoting Girl Writes What from her video, to which this video is a response, quote, when you act like a child, people see you as a child, end quote. There seems to me to exist a rather nefarious synergy between neoteny and hypoagency, both feeding into each other, and further cementing what results from that synergy. And generally speaking, we as a collective seek to help women, rendering them aid as needed, just as we seek to protect them from the ills of the world, certainly from violent death, and we generally wish to make their lives easier. On a microcosmic scale, we see this in the day-to-day -day interactions of both men and women, displaying their favoritism towards women. And in many countries, the state itself has become a proxy father-slash-provider partner for women, wherein men's hard-earned resources are siphoned away from them to provide for women's needs and wants, no matter how unwarranted these might be. The issue that, in my observation, I would classify as most grave, resulting from this nefarious coupling of neoteny and hypoagency is the manifestation of solipsism in the female, what I oftentimes in more pedestrian terms call the me syndrome. And children, especially infants and very young children, are necessarily solipsistic in their perceptions, in large measure because their very existence is dependent upon others and their needs being met by others, lest they perish. And since they lack the ability to provide for themselves, the screaming infant 
lacking agency, must be solipsistic in order to survive. And the respective parent can countenance that solipsism or not. More often than not, he or she does, since parents wish that their progeny survive to reproduce themselves. Now, I'm not going to claim to be in possession of the knowledge of what exactly a baby sees or perceives and what it desires for that matter, but it is safe to make the assumption that the self is the primary mode of perception and operation, meaning that to the extent that others do exist for a child, for a baby, they exist to service its needs, be it hunger, wanting a toy, having nappies changed, etc. This can only be called a solipsistic worldview. Part of the process of growing up and becoming an adult is the acknowledgement of the existence of others within a social environment as independent entities. The independent entities have their own interests and drives, which may or may not coincide with those of the maturing individual. To reach a state of being wherein the separation of being is both acknowledged internally and externally, something observable through behavior, is to have reached essentially what one might call a state of adulthood. A person who continues with a childlike, i.e. solipsistic worldview, is one that adulthood has eluded, for whom others continue to exist only as extensions of its desires, or rather to service those desires. Behold the human female, a creature we factually know to physiologically resemble a child, and through the derivative hypoagency indeed act, oftentimes, much like a child. Children are not endowed with a sense of responsibility. This must be learnt and acquired. And responsibility to others can only be acquired if otherhood itself is something that has legitimately been acknowledged. If many women are essentially children, then solipsism should be readily observable in a similar fashion to children in female behavior, and I believe it is. Consider female entitlement. Children feel entitled because all they know are their needs and wants. They know no differently, and unfortunately in many cases the same can be said of women. Looking at the many instances of false rape accusations, whereby the female falsely claims a man has raped her, and the consequences that those accusations bring about, we can see this in play. In the case of Brian Banks, his female accuser sought to gain vast money through a lawsuit against the school district where the alleged rape took place. Never mind her slight resentment, uh, or less than slight resentment, at allegedly being snubbed by Brian. And Brian was just a tool in the service of her desires, and the fact that Winetta Gibson went through, it, went through with it shows quite clearly that Brian's otherhood was not acknowledged. The disgruntled wife, who divorces on a whim, demanding payment from the hard-working husband, taking his children away is no different because neither the husband nor the children are independent entities. Indeed, how often do we hear women speak in almost symbiotic terms of the child growing in their wombs? The husband owes her the money because that is what she wants. The children are extensions of herself, and thus there is no question of custody. And neither is it different in the case of the female who maintains a quote-unquote serious relationship with one man who provides her with financial services and gifts and simultaneously keeps a lover on the side to service her sexual needs. A person possessed of a solipsistic worldview does not need to justify or rationalize any of this, since everything outside the self is there to serve the self, as is the case with a child. Remorse, regret, guilt, these feelings are foreign, and wrongdoing can easily be broken down into the simplistic formula of, quote, does it make me feel good or does it not, end quote. At the same time, since parents generally bend over backwards to service the needs of the solipsistic child, so too does the modern state service the needs of its children, namely women. From rape shield laws to job and education quotas, when a woman wants something, the state gives it to her almost reflexively, 
in a manner little different to the way most men bend over backwards to satisfy the needs of the dissatisfied children, the satisfied children they call girlfriends and wives. Of course, there are differences between infant solipsism and adult female solipsism, as children usually only have simplistic needs that are easily met. Food, for example. The nefarious melding of neoteny and hypoagency, on the other hand, in a woman child, expands those needs astronomically, since the child is part adult as well. And since all of this is wrapped up in the most atavistic and primal aspects of the human condition, both in what women are and how the world, specifically the world of the men, accommodates them in how they are, there is unfortunately no end in sight. Under normal circumstances, children grow up, but this maturation does not seem likely to take place since women in their actions and men in their reactions to those actions uh, find themselves in an arrested state of development. Neither a bright present nor a bright future, since the future only promises more of the same. Unfortunate. Thanks for watching.